not already know, is an architect and urban conservationist. Upon completing her Bachelor's of Architecture from Mumbai University and Master's of Arts from Smith College in, in Northampton, USA, from where she was later awarded a doctorate, she started her firm, Somaya and Kalapa Consultants, in 1978 in Mumbai. Over the years, she has won numerous international and national awards and honors, including being chosen as one of the 75 Indian women in STEM on India's 75th anniversary of independence in 2022. She's the founder trustee of the Hekar Foundation, which has brought out several publications of heritage and architecture. In 2000, she curated a conference, Women in Architecture in 2000, you should check that out when you can, because it's, again, an inspiring series of, of conversations as well. And organize a seminal exhibition on the work of women architects with a special focus on South Asia. In 2020, she chaired an international conversation, uh, sorry, con conference on women in design, 2020 plus, a landmark event for women designers from across the globe to showcase SNK's work, as well as provide a platform to collaborate. Joining Brinda, joining Mrs. Somaya, is Mrinalni, who will be in conversation with her. Thank you, Sneha. This is um, especially special for me, Mrs. Somaya. It's been incredible. I've known you for many years. And what I keep going back to is that you were my first professional interview. And it's an honor to have you here to conclude Conscious Collective with us this evening. So thank you so much. Um, what I also recall from my first interaction with you was I was just breaking in, into the media space and I, I came up to you and I said that I'd like to interview you and you were just, you listened and you took out the time and you took the trouble to understand what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it and made it a collaborative effort. And I remember going back and thinking, and I told my mom this, and I said, I've never met somebody who's been so empathetic in the first meeting. You, you didn't know me, I didn't really know you, but there was just this sense of welcome and support, and you told me that whatever I needed, you would be available, and you were so accessible. And what's incredible is that over the years, I have observed other people use the same word for you. The sense, this, the word empathy has been attributed to you on a number of occasions. In fact, Mary Woods, your very dear friend, um, wrote an entire article, an essay in your book called The Empathetic Ar Architect. And she actually starts not by talking about you directly, but I'm going to quote her if I can find it. Um, she quotes Neera Adarkar and who says that as architects, we should create space for people to speak, not to speak for them. A good architect is empathetic to the needs of her users. So I'd like to start with this, and I'd like to ask you, how do you differentiate between the needs of the client and the needs of the user in your journey? Or do you feel the need to differentiate that? I think the most important thing uh, is to understand who is an architect. How do you see yourself? Where do you see your responsibilities, your commitments, uh, your passions? Uh, what a wonderful profession. I don't think anything in the world could be better than this, and why? And the reason is because it encompasses and spans so many different verticals and responsibilities. Um, the client, of course, to answer Menalini specifically, uh, I think over the years, the way one builds up one's own practice by your own ethics, your own value systems, and the type of projects you do, and the way you do them, you will get a specific type of client who will come to you. And I think to that extent, we have been privileged uh, if then so when they come, I think they understand our body of work. And the, to some extent, they understand the way we work as well. It is most important to understand whom you're building for. And if you have to understand that, you cannot have your own ego. 
that has to be dropped. It cannot exist. And I think many of us in India have been brought up, especially my generation, senior citizen with my gray hair, that, you know, that's what it's all about. We come from a very, very poor country. Things have changed now. But I finished my studies in the 70s. Uh, we were really impoverished in many ways. And uh, it was such a large country with so many different geographies, dialects, people, religions, all sorts of things. And here we were in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, building up a practice in a, in a very isolated, doubly isolated way, because I was a woman also. So I think we were very sensitive to what was around us. We didn't see uh, so much of what all you young people see today and which you're privileged to see. So I don't think it was something that was conscious. It was just something that happened to us. We would, I remember going on the streets of South Mumbai and seeing children with orange hair. And one of the things, children get orange hair only when they're so acutely malnutritioned. Yeah. So we're talking about a whole different time. So empathy was something that was instilled and ingrained, uh, I think, in, in many of us at that time. And naturally, it moved on to the practice. The practice always, uh, the diversity of SNK is what um, I love so much. You've often been referred to, and I think this is a term that you coined yourself, the bridge generation, right? And did you think that you were responsible for or you needed to take the responsibility to do that? Or was that just something that came naturally and organically to you? Well, it was a very lonely and hard journey for me, uh, the first few years, first two decades, I would say. I lived and worked in Mumbai, and at that time we had, you know, post-independence. Uh, it was the Nehruvian era. We had a lot of large public buildings being built, uh, institutions, embassies, uh, water management, colleges, everything. And uh, I don't think any architects got the work except Delhi architects, <laughs> frankly, uh, to be honest. Maybe one or two very famous ones like Charles Courier or people like that who were really, really renowned. But there was no place for people like me, you know, in that at all. And we never even dreamt in our wildest dreams that we would ever be, you know, a part of what was happening at that time. But through determination, through struggle, and not trying to compete, just believing, focused in what you believe the country needed. Because I came back from America after mm. quite a few years, and I chose to come back because I was very clear that I did not want to be peripheral to the society in which I lived and worked in. And I could only be that if I came back to my own country. So it didn't worry me, you know, what I was doing. I began with a tiny pro bono job. And, and that's what's important, is that you take, if you believe in the client, if you believe in the people, you take the work. And that project, which was pro bono, led me to a small pain project which led me to one of my biggest projects, an industrial complex. And till today, the next generation of that client is still my client and works with my daughter Nandini. So, you know, architecture is about also, when you build up a practice, is about people coming back to you because they believe in you, because you have similar value systems. So it's, it, it was not easy. But over the years, uh, I worked hard, very hard. And there was a professor, Madhav Deo Bhakta. I don't know how many of you know of him. And one day in 1990, I got a phone call from him. I'd been practicing almost 15 years. And I'd built up a body of work, small works, but architectural projects, which I finished. And he called me, and he invited me to give a lecture in Nagpur. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked. He's actually inviting me to give a lecture about my work. It was the Malvanka Memorial Lecture. And he and his wife, and uh, Hema Sankalya, mm -hmm. 
the three of us went by train from Bombay to Nagpur, where I gave my first public lecture. So, so then, of course, you know, by the time, I, of course, I, know, I knew Doshi, I knew Korea, I knew all of them, knew all of them. But those days were different. But I was able to be independent. I was able to stand on my own two feet and not compromise my beliefs uh, in what I believed the role of an architect should be. An architect should be a guardian of the built and the unbuilt environment. And I was very clear on that. It's interesting that you say the built and the unbuilt environment, and I, I will come back to that. But um, what's also interesting is, and I think um, Nandini mentions this in her essay in, in the book, um, and she talks about the master, right, and the role of the master. And I wanted to mention this. Um, that the, ma the, the skill of a master is to be able to convey to others their architecture in a simple language and form. And you've always talked about this. You've talked about how in a simple way, if you can convey what you want to say, you can do what you want to do. Albert Einstein said, if you can't say it simply, you don't understand it. That's it. And that's my philosophy. Uh, I am a professor emerita at uh, Cornell University. I was the chairperson of the School of Planning and Architecture, Vijayawada for six years, and many such things. So it's not that I'm not familiar with the academic world, but I'm very, very clear that as a practicing professional, uh, there are two verticals, and they are different in many ways. Um, words, we have to understand the words we use, and we have, people have to understand what we're saying. <clears throat> so it's a, I think, a, I certainly consider myself more of a practitioner than an academician. So I think my language is direct, straightforward, much simpler, and easy to understand. But how do you communicate that with the people that you work with? You have been known to kind of, in a way, write your own briefs or go beyond the briefs that are given to you, right? And you have a tendency to include the people that are around you within the work that you do. Um, and I am sort of implying that you, and I've heard that you will put into your contracts that the site should be a certain way, there should be certain conditions for people at site. How do you communicate that to your clients? And how do you convince them to do that? With a sense of humor, I hope, <laughs> because they don't seem to. I think... Uh, and yet you've, you've found success in that. Yes. I think most people are good. Most human beings are good. And if they're not threatened, and if they listen, and if they hear what you have to say, I think they will believe in it. For me, it was very clear. Um, I remember my first building which I built was in Chembur. And um, I was seven months pregnant with uh, my first child, who's not here today. He lives in America. And my, it was just three days before my due date. And my mother was horrified that I was going to the site. So she came with me. And uh, I reached the site, and I climbed up to the first floor. And there were a lot of women who were carrying the concrete, you know, on their, in their heads like they used to those days. And they looked at me with such empathy, I will never forget. And I decided that day that I was going to do whatever I could for them. So in my own way, I made sure that uh, we, in, we put it into our bills of quantities, into our specifications. I told contractors they made 20, 25% and they can jolly well give some of this away. Uh, I actually inspected the labor quarters for both men and women. I remember we were doing a project in Bits Pilani, and I arrived in Pilani from Delhi very late at night. And they didn't believe that I would really go and see the, you know, the, the site where the workers were working. And when I went there, it was just terrible. They were shocked. And they said, please come back tomorrow morning. Because they, they couldn't believe that I would actually yeah. go. So I go to all my workers' sites. Um, when nowadays, the tragedy, what's happened, is that women workers have been eliminated 
from projects. Mm. And the main reason is the contractors don't want to be bothered with the children. Uh, in earlier sites, we actually set up creches for the, uh, for the women, uh, for the children of the workers, because the women had to go and work. And uh, one day in a very big bis biscuit factory we were doing in Bangalore, I asked the women over there, I said, who's looking after the children in the creche? And she said, we are seven women, we have formed a team, one of us stays back, six of us go to the site, and the money we earn for the day, we s divide by seven. So this is the extent that they were struggling to make sure. And you know, they, they used to work in cement, the bathrooms were terrible, there was no water. So each one of us can make the difference, and this is what I talk about all the time. Also, we have to stop giving women the most menial work in the construction industry. If any of you, I'm sure many of you have been to the United States and many countries like that, you have women welders, you have women who are tying steel, you have women right on top of the building, you have women painters. The skilled and, workers. And why yeah. are our women, so actually now if you go to any of the sites in Mumbai, I'm sure you've seen the coastal road, I'm sure you've seen the, the metro that's going on. Have any of you seen any women workers? Why? They used to be there. They used to be there in large numbers. And they have to come back because we are 50% of the population. So this is extremely important, but you know, we can't say there has to be reservation for them. <laughs> but, and yet, I mean, there have been times when you've been a big advocate for upskilling women. So it's not only about providing them creches or facilities and infrastructure, but also allowing them to gain the skill to become skilled workers, to take on the jobs that what traditionally men or conventionally men have been doing at site. Why? And how, well, do we, how do we actually translate that? We started, I started by talking to paint companies mm -hmm. because I believe paint, women can be painters quite easily, uh, especially in central India, in places like Bihar and Jharkhand, where there's a lot of poverty. So uh, we set up, I pushed some clients to set up some centers. They were always making excuses about security of how will we these, these women go, we send them somewhere to paint and how do we keep them secure. So I said, you bloody well find a way and uh, you know, you can get a bus, you can put a security person. They've done that. And of course we know places like in Ahmedabad, they teach women mm -hmm. to be masons. But we have to go beyond women lab labor and construction. We have to talk about women in the field as well. You know, Absolutely. we are now 60% in colleges, but we're 20% in, in, in practice. In practice yeah. And probably even less in independent practices. So where do they, you know, the invisible women. So we did do two conferences. Nandini and I run a foundation called the Hekar mm -hmm. Foundation. We did women in um, architecture in 2000. Anupama was there. Yeah. She's gone to sleep or she's <laughs> waving. And uh, all the young women we called at that time, I was looking at a picture recently because the Biennale in Delhi is showing mm -hmm. our work and they asked for both these conference videos to be shown in Delhi. And I saw all these young women, you know, and each one of them, they were about 15 or 18, are all such big, important architects today. And I felt very happy. And we called women from Pakistan, from Sri Lanka, from Bangladesh, who had never been called to India. I'm not bashing the men today, okay? I have a <laughs> lot of respect for men. But since she started talking about... And then in 2000, we did a Women in Design, which really Nandini curated, where we took a completely different angle because youth have come in. And architecture today is not just design of buildings. It's way beyond. It's photography, it's history, it's archaeology, it's uh, science, it's name it, it's there. So we had people from all the different verticals come for this conference. So there's so much to be done, but there's so much to celebrate. We call it a celebration of women. So one of the reasons I brought up the process and what's happening on site and how you feel strongly about this is also because I wanted to ask whether when you practice empathy and you nurture empathy on site, does that also alter the way you practice design? You know, we talk about 
the way that the techniques that we want to use in construction will alter the way or will influence the way that we design on paper. But what I wanted to draw was that when you're looking at people and you're looking at infrastructure and you're looking at providing for certain uh, communities on the site, and in, not just the site, but through the process of building, does that in a way influence or drive your design as well? You know, I'm often asked, asked this question whether women architects design differently. I don't believe that. Uh, because I wouldn't say for, not, not as a gender thing, but okay. just in terms of, you know, is, as someone who is empathetic to processes and to people and to the, de to the design journey, how does that influence your work? And, or does it at all? I don't think empathy is something separate from one's being. And architecture is a very, very tough, difficult profession. It's not at all easy. It's difficult to get work, uh, as you have to build up a portfolio of work to get bigger work. And once the bigger work comes, it's very complex and complicated. So I think we have to understand that it is a highly technical and knowledgeable profession. And all the other emotional and human qualities are within us as people. But the way we have to deal with projects, it's not easy. Of course, we have issues. We have clients. We have tough clients. We have projects which, which change. We have uh, projects which disappear. We have projects who don't pay us. I mean, we all know all this. And we also know that we are extremely underpaid profession. Uh, now the Council of Architecture has come up with MAP, where they have clearly mm -hmm. indicated the fees. And unless we are paid well, we cannot do good work, nor can we be ethical in our work. So, you know, where we talk about uh, COA saying 5%, when you talk to Americans, they get 12%. They're horrified to hear the percentage fees that we get. So this is a big issue uh, with competitions, with the RFPs that come in. I'm sure all you young people face these big problems. Uh, I've actually gone to Delhi uh, to talk to some, the ministry over there, uh, requesting them to get rid of that 80-20 nonsense, give the job to the best, best, most creative solution for the project. But they say they can't do it. So that is why I want all you young people to get into politics. So you all become ministers and secretaries and IAS officers, and then you tell them what needs to be done for our profession. It's interesting that you bring up the, the paid aspect of the profession, because very often in the creative field, right, we are told that, oh, <clears throat> you're creative, you've taken this because you have the passion for it and you have the love for it. So that is what should drive you and that is what you should do. But that is not what puts food on the table at the end of the day, is it? I mean, there's, there's a difference between, a pa between passion and a hobby and a profession, and that distinction needs to be made. Of course, it's an extremely difficult profession. Uh, right from the beginning, to get the project, to understand the project, especially large projects. Today, we have a series of people who will be collaborating on a project. It's not just the architect, the structural engineer. You have various, various other people involved. So it, it's, a, it's not easy to do. And uh, now you have digital technology, you have AI coming in, you have the newest software trying to keep up with it. So many different things. It's, it's a tough profession. And unfortunately, you know, people think, most people don't know what an architect does. You know, they say, are you an architect? Even not so much today, but are you an architecture or, you know, such stupid things they ask. They don't really know, even today, people really don't know what is the role of an architect. How would you decide, define it? <laughs> you used the word guardian earlier. <laughs> I think... You know, I'll tell a little story here because um, the role of an architect is, in my mind, a responsibility to society, to your communities, but to the aesthetic of a nation as well, to what you see, what you feel around you, to, be, to appreciate it, to enjoy the beauty. We had so much beauty in our country, but you go to 
tier two or tier three cities today. I don't have to tell you. I'm sure most of you travel around a lot like all of us architects do. And it's, it's just a tragedy. So, the, so how, do you, how are you able to combine all that together? And yet, today we're growing so big. We have enormous size projects, complex projects. That combination is, is, is really um, the challenge. We have to really move fast and with the times. But we have to understand the past as, you know, the very famous, um, um, he was the, actually the ambassador, Mexican ambassador. He said that in India, the past is not past. The past is just passing by. So unless we understand everything that's gone before us, it will not be possible for us to truly go ahead in a contemporary way. That's interesting because you also, uh, I think there was an interview uh, where you mentioned that we were talking about, there was a talk about conservation and looking at the past and looking at heritage. And everyone today looks at heritage and thinks about the past, but no one's looking at contemporary heritage. No one's looking at actually preserving what we have currently. And you made an interesting statement saying that 20th century architecture and what we, what we are currently building is also part of our existence and part of our heritage, right? How do you feel about that? Well, of course, because uh, it's not just for what's gone before, but we need a circular economy today, you know, and, and that's what this conference is all about. So what does a circular economy mean? A circular economy means that there's no waste, because all of us overnight cannot give up fossil fuels, as uh, Mr. Jamshed Godrej said on Friday, that you're very proud you're running an electric car, but you know, where does the power come from? It comes from coal. So you know, we have to understand that we can't overnight become different. So what's really important is there should be no waste. We should retrofit, we should repair, we should restore, we should do re-architecture, and it shouldn't just be for the big famous buildings. It has to be for our ordinary buildings as well. You see that all over the world. So why not over here? Because the moment you demolish a building, and not that I have never done that. Sometimes we've had to do that when the building is in a, not a heritage building, of course, but the worst buildings that are in a bad state are the buildings which were built in the 70s, as most of you know, when cement and sand was absolutely adulterated. And those are the buildings which are actually, you know, in a bad state. So we don't demolish. If you demolish when um, I built, rebuilt a, a village in Buj after the Kutch earthquake, when I went there in January, January 26th was the earthquake, we went the following week, uh, we saw rubble everywhere. The entire village had been demolished completely by the earthquake. But we used all the rubble for the foundation again. We didn't waste the rubble. We collected all the doors and windows. We numbered them. And although we rebuilt, we reused. So it's very important that in a country like ours, we have a circular economy. If I have a minute, um, I'm on the board of something called the Wholesome Foundation mm -hmm. for Sustainable Construction. And they give very, very large awards. Uh, a year and a half ago, the gold award went to a Swiss lady in Zurich. And uh, they said she won the award for a building that she built. So I thought it was a res restored building. They took us to the building. What she had done was she had gone round all the buildings that were being demolished in Switzerland. And she had taken measurements of the trusses, of the windows, of the doors. Because the moment you use something and you break it up, and then put it back again, you've again lost a huge amount of energy. And she rebuilt this entire building with all these different things. So it wasn't a five-star hotel, but everything worked. There was an auditorium, there were architects' offices, and I was on the jury. We gave her the gold award because that building was really, really built without using any external energy, which was really outstanding. So you have to think out of the box, you know, not just these same old words, sustainable construction, this, that. How do you build a circular economy? It doesn't matter how big or how small it is. Each one of you can, can think about what it is you can do. 
just like one man's trash is another man's treasure, but it, you just have to identify the potential of what you see and what you have around you. Um, in fact, Mary Wood, she talks about it and she says that empathy entails seeing potential. And she refers to your uh, project in Kolaba, the Kolaba Woods, which was an old dump yard, if I'm not mistaken. Well, what motivated you to work on something like that? Well, I, to be honest, I lived right opposite it. And it was a real garbage dump with some PWD buildings. And this was in the 80s, when there were no public-private partnerships in Mumbai for parks. And uh, there were Tatas said that they would give us the money if we converted it into a park. Mm -hmm. So we managed to get the PWD to remove their broken down structures. And we uh, got water from the buildings around, the gray water, which we used for irrigation. And we raised money and made it into an eight acre park called Kalaba Woods, which stood for years until recently with the metro there is some issue. And what was interesting, uh, this area, which is typical of Mumbai, uh, you have very wealthy apartments on one side, you have the slums on the other side, everything cheek by jowl. Now in countries like South Africa, if any of you have been to Cape Town or any of those places, you will notice that there's never a mixture of different economic levels within the city. Mm. Cape Town will have exclusive you know, residences in one area, and then if you go 10, 20 kilometers out, you'll have what they call the colored area, which is mixed black and white. And then if you go way out, you will have the black area. But that's not our case. We look out of our window, we'll see a slum. We look out of our window, we'll see a half a billion dollar apartment building as well, right? So what was important was the way we designed it, we designed it for everybody. We created a small pergola where children from the slums could come and study at night because they didn't have you know, rooms or electricity. We created a pathway for old people. We created a little auditorium. And then when we were ready to open it, the municipality said, uh, you have to charge two rupees per day for these children to come in. We said, absolutely not. If a family has four children, you think they're going to spend eight or 10 rupees a day to send their children to the park? So we won that battle. And I have to tell you, it was these children who really looked after that park. They never let it get destroyed. I think there was a picture when Nandini talked mm -hmm. of a group of people sitting, if any of you saw that, that was in Kalaba Woods. And after that, many, many other public-private partnerships came up for gardens within the city. So you can always lead by example, and it can be a small project, but finish it. Never leave it halfway. The danger is the frustration, the bureaucracy, the p politics, and then you say, oh, it can't be done. You have to strive, whether it takes two years, five years, or 10 years, you have to finish that project. That gets me to one of my favorite projects of yours, which is the Tata House. And um, what I really enjoy about it is the fact that there's care not only for the client and what the client asked you to do, but to go beyond that and develop your own brief and say that I'm going to sim not sympathize, but empathize with the context and the different elements over there, the, the people and the non-people, and include them into this structure. Um, and Nandini and I once had a really interesting chat about this, but if you could tell us a little bit more about how you cater to the non-humans in that client, in that project. Well, you know, we've done a lot of work for the Tatas over the years. Uh, they've been a great support as clients. Um, and when they came to us for Bombay House, um, Bombay House, we knew, of course, Mr. Ratan Tata was involved also in the project. And there were many dogs uh, which, were, which he looked after and which were inside the building as well. So Nandini is also a dog lover. She was very clear what she wanted to do. So they built a lovely kennel within uh, to look after the dogs. And while we were actually doing the project, it was a project which we had to uh, finish in nine months before the uh, birthday of Mr. J.R.D. Tata. Mm -hmm. So we had to work 24-7. And we had to restore the building, we had to structurally upgrade it, and we had to do the interior. So we were there day and night. And we all, all of our teams would say it was these dogs, you know, who used to be our guardians. And 
look after us, make sure nobody else attacked us at night. And they're still there. <laughs> because I went a couple of weeks ago, and they're still there. <laughs> but that's wonderful to allow for an architectural brief to extend beyond what the, the required checklist is, right? To, and, and I think that also starts to differentiate the need of the user versus the client, if we come back to the first question, where it's not necessarily the client that gives you that checklist that you need to check off, but to actually understand what is required at the site, which also brings me back to the built environment versus you know, the built and the non-built environment and having empathy and nurturing empathy for that and for the process, um, where we're not only looking at, it's, you're, you're looking at the people who are involved in the process, you're looking at people who are in the space, but the space itself needs a sense of equilibrium where you see in, in projects such as the Kolaba Woods. Right? Um, we also spoke about dignity initially when we had this chat earlier, and dignity not only for the people who are working on the construction site, but also dignity for people who are in the office, a sense of ownership and the part, the role that they play in the process. And, and you know, everyone's got their little parts and everyone comes together as a well-oiled machine. And I know you have very strong views on this idea of dignity, if you'd like to. Yes, of course, because I believe that every human being uh, has to have that dignity. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, one project perhaps which would el uh, elaborate on this would be a school we did in Baroda. It's called the Nalanda School. Mm -hmm. And we had a client who came to us and uh, believed in the Gan Gandhian principles. And uh, he had gone around, I think, searching for architects. And then he came to see me, I remember, in my old office one morning. And by the end of the conversation, he said, I have found my architect, which was very nice. We're very good friends even today. So the school is enormous now because we built it over many years. Uh, what was important is we used the idea of courtyards. And we broke all, uh, it was a baby school, junior school, middle school, and senior school, built over maybe eight or 10 years. And the courtyards were such that each courtyard belonged to a group of children they had classrooms, so there was a primary, secondary, and tertiary space within that architectural model. And the children in that, court, in that space had to look after the courtyard, they had to look after the toilets within, that, in, within their space and their classrooms. So that was the dignity of labor that he created within these children and which stands even today. So there are many ways that you can give dignity to people. And certainly through your architectural design and detailing is one very strong way that you can give dignity to the users. Um, I'm also going to quote you, and I read somewhere where you say that, like we need to have rhythm, harmony, and balance in architecture. In our design, we need to have strength, heroic initiatives, and assertive excellence. And I think that, even though this is something that you said, but that sums you up really well in your practice, because you have been an advocate for all these values, not only within the four walls of your office, but you have spearheaded a lot of these movements across various sites, across your work, across your practice, and um, allowed to be an example for others to follow. And I think that's something that must be emphasized here tonight. And I do thank you for that on, I'm sure, behalf of a lot of people. Um, I'm getting indication that we're running out of time. I, will, I would <laughs> like to end with one small story. Some of you may have heard of it before. You've been here the last two days, and we know the complexity and the huge responsibilities that all of us, you young people particularly, are going to have as you move ahead in the profession. So I always like to tell this little story, if I may. Of course. Um, there was, some of you may have heard of it, heard it from me before. There was a huge forest fire, an enormous fire in a forest. And all the animals were running away. The, only, the tigers, the lions, the bears, or whatever, everybody ran, all the animals ran away. The only little animal, if you may call it, that stayed behind was a little bird. 
And that little bird was flying from this fire to a little bo water body nearby, taking a little water in its beak and coming back and trying to put off this fire. And all the animals laughed and said, you know, you're never going to be put out. You're never going to be able to put off this fire and you're going to get burnt, you're just wasting that time. So that bird said, at least I'm doing my bit. So I gave this, I shared this story in one of my uh, presentations which I gave in Goa some years ago. And when I came back to Mumbai the next day, my email box was full of emails from young people, young architects like you, and they said, ma'am, you, you don't know the rest of the story because this is a real folk story. So what happened was that the gods above were watching this little bird flying up and down between the fire and this body of water, collecting water and coming back. And the gods felt so sad that they began to cry. And when gods cry, it comes down as rain. And when it rained, the fire was put off. So each one of you today, just go out and do your bit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Samaya. That is incredible. I'm actually going to open up the floor to the audience. Madhav, we have a question right here. Hi, Brinda. Hi. Uh, OK, so I, hearing you speak today has kind of sort of um, given me reason to think about seriously pursuing this. And this is something that I'll probably come and have a separate conversation with you about. Is this idea of repair um, in located in pedagogy, especially in when design and architecture is taught? So one, of course, is a thing that folks talk about now uh, in terms of sustainability. One of the important things, whether one is designing architecture or products or whatever, is repairability. So you kind of try and move away from a built-in obsolescence uh, situation. But what I feel, and I'd like you to respond, because your practice does uh, inculcate or, or, or induct processes of conservation and preservation inherently in the, cre in the idea of making a new uh, building. Like you spoke about it, I think, in terms of archaeology or the importance of that. Uh, is there a sort of, um, is, uh, do you see any hurdles in perception when one talks about, you know, having an architecture course or having kids come and say that we want to become architects. Is there a problem in us teaching them how to repair as a basic baseline skill set before you start thinking of speculations and new buildings and innovation and stuff? What are your thoughts on that? I see absolutely no difference in an architect being able to build new buildings and conservation. In a country like ours, I have always said that each and every one of us has to build new and has to conserve. I'm very clear in that. It definitely should be part of, of undergraduate education. Just by finishing your five years and then doing a one-year course in York or Timbuktu or wherever, you don't thesis. become a conservation thesis, architect. Yeah. You become a conservation architect because of your belief, your passion, your learning through your mistakes. And we all have to do that in every single architectural practice. I've managed when I was chairperson of SPA to introduce at least a master's course in Vijayawada for conservation. But it has to be an undergraduate course. I mean, it's just crazy that it's not. Absolutely. So and you learn from you about both. that later. Then. You learn from both when you're building new, we build so much new, we build you know, big uh, campuses, institutions, all over the country. So we learn from our conservation, and our conservation learns from the new. And in India, we have 10,000 listed ASI monuments. We must be having hundreds of thousands of non-listed monuments. And we say that we architects are not going to repair and restore those. No wonder we are peripheral to society even today. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, ma'am. Uh, firstly, this has been a very inspiring session. Thank you for this. Uh, what I'm, I'm very new to this industry, actually. But uh, what I want to understand from you is that, you know, you've spoken about how the industry is all about bureaucracy, dominance, ego, all of these things. And still, you've got the power to, you know, stand by your values, principles. So, 
you've you've always been this driven since inception or uh, situations made you this strong to stick to your values i've always been this way anybody who knows our studio knows uh, the ethics and the integrity of snk and everybody who works for it um, there might be many people who don't come to us because of who we are but there are many people who come to us because of who we are and that's fine i also know it's not easy for young practices today uh, the temptations are many uh, the fees are poor but unless we all get together as a fraternity and stop under you know undervaluing each other it's not going to change we brought out the map and yet i know people who have read that are still undercoating you know we all just have to get together and say this is what we're going to do and we do it we've lost we've lost many projects in snk because of our fees but that's okay we get projects where people just come to us straight and say we know who you are we know the way you work mention your fees and the job is yours and we got one like that uh, in sri lanka actually uh, yesterday so you know the balance will come but it's not easy for young people but 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 believe me in the long run it is worth it because you will have the strength and the power to tell everyone to gth if they don't do what you want remember that thank you so much we've got a whole host of questions hi ma'am um so i what i wanted to ask was uh, i'm your ah uh, so one is definitely the drive but a lot of practitioners want to inculcate sustainability in their practices but the resources and infrastructure that has been set around is not supporting you know what we want to put out in the world how do you navigate that i'm a graphic designer i'm not from this field but i think we follow the same process so so you're saying that how does one follow or practice so, sustainably so yeah when the infrastructure is not supporting these values that you have how do you navigate such a situation or a project it's not easy as i keep saying um in today i have found at least in most of the government governmental and private projects people have become very aware of a uh, circular economy zero carbon in fact all the rfps or all the inquiries we get that seems to form a basis for it now whether you want to follow leads or abcd i'm not really so interested in all that i believe more that you have to understand how do you make your building sustainable and i think it's you know that you today all over the world there is so much happening it's very important that all of you people read journals go on to the internet understand what's happening in different parts of the world for instance the european union is one of the most progressive uh, groups of people who are bringing out a lot of connected suggestions for the construction industry where there is the way to to uh, make concrete how do you, you know we can never really get rid of concrete so let's be honest about it so how do you make concrete that's much more sustainable i think there's something outside today also which i saw about that uh, what are the different ways you use it you know i'm tired of of indians getting awards for just mud and bamboo we cannot build just mud and bamboo in a country with 1.5 billion people it can be used in small areas you know for certain things but we finally have to use concrete and steel so how do we use concrete and steel that's that's going to be the challenge how do we make that sustainable we know mud and bamboo is sustainable right so how do we look at the bigger picture all of us many of us are doing very big projects how do we make sure that those projects are also sustainable and they have zero carbon Uh, we have done a project in goa the goa institute of management where we have created uh, enough solar so that the entire it's a it's a university almost has enough energy electricity for itself and to put on the grid so you know little compromises may take 
place in your architectural design because you may have to incorporate some of these things, but that's the way of the future. You have to do that and see how best you can create that balance. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. We might have time for one more question. The gentleman at the back, please. Namaskar. I'm tire three, tire four cities ka jo architectural fraternity hai usko represent karta hu. Aur uh, you being an academician and practitioner, both uh, to, and we are talking about empathy. I think sahanubhuti or samvedana, ye dono cheeze agar hume agli jo future generations hai architect, uh, architects ki, unme inculcate karni hai, to COA ke level pe jo chal raha hai, ki we'll be doing one year internship or we'll be having passing out exam after graduation or something like that to make people, architects, uh, graduating architects more into uh, su sustainable themselves into the uh, ecosystem which is uh, c framing up. Do you think uh, that it is a time to, uh, uh, to send our future uh, like budding architects to the lower uh, strata of the society uh, or the country like villages, towns to understand the fabric of architecture over there and then come back and uh, uh, make themselves sensitive about and sensible about the future of the rural uh, 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 areas aspiring to become urban uh, areas. So, instead of having an extended six months uh, program of internship, just like there is a compulsive tenure for, uh, for doctors to go to the rural areas and understand their uh, uh, practice, do you think it is time for us, especially Indian budding architects or students to understand the rural fabric of uh, Indian architecture? changing uh, things? I don't believe anything should be forced because I know a lot of the rural doctors used to pay them, pay off and stop going. I believe it's got to come from within your heart. For instance, uh, SNK, our practice, we have built from the Himalayas down to deep south, from the east, uh, through tribal areas of Jharkhand, through Ranchi, through Madhya Pradesh, through Bhuj. I, I was born and brought up in Mumbai. I went to school here, I went to university here and then to America. I never lived in a rural area. But I don't think I needed to go and stay six months to feel that empathy. I think it, it has to be within us, it has to be developed. And I think that's the role of an architect, that's the richness of our profession. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sumai. I think it's a very important thought because architecture is also very contextual, but a lot of that comes from research and study of what you want to build and where you want to build it. Um, and of course, you can go live in, in a particular area and get that experience and you know, feel the ground over there, but you could do it in different ways as well. Thank you so much.